Why do humans fight? Psychologists would tell us that the alternative is flight, but what if you don't have the choice to run away? What makes us fight? And I mean really fight for something, like your life. I want you to imagine being trapped in your own body. Imagine that you have something as simple as an itch on your head or your leg, but your arms and hands won't move to scratch it, and your mouth, it won't speak to ask someone to scratch it for you. So you sit there, and you hope that the itch will pass. I want you to imagine waking up in the morning and not being able to get yourself out of bed. Brush your own teeth, comb your own hair, put on your own clothes. Go to the bathroom by yourself. Feed or bathe yourself. Your body has completely shut down on you. This is ALS. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a motor neuron disease that robs the body of its ability to function. There are roughly 30,000 Americans dying from this disease each year. ALS attacks the muscles and slowly takes away the ability to eat, swallow, walk, talk, and eventually to breathe. Your brain, however, remains sharp and aware, and you can still feel all sensations, but you are trapped in what patients call a glass coffin, and you are told there is nothing you can do to save your life. Lastly, I want you to imagine that you are 29 years old, newly married, with your whole life ahead of you, and you are given this death sentence. My husband Eric and I met nine years ago at UC Berkeley, where we were both collegiate athletes. Eric was captain of the football team at Cal, and then went on to play in the NFL with the St. Louis Rams. He soon realized that football wasn't the career path for him, so like his two older brothers, Eric decided to become an LA City firefighter. He wanted to make a difference and give back to the community that helped raise him, because that's just the kind of person that he is. He's always choosing to put others before himself. Like when he first started experiencing symptoms last March, but instead of telling anybody, Eric decided to keep it to himself because he didn't want me or anyone else to worry. Because our wedding was coming up and he didn't want to make a big deal about it. But little did we know, it was a big deal. In fact, it was a huge deal, an enormous deal, and I can easily say that just after the best day of our lives came the absolute worst. Eric and I got married in front of our family and friends on July 27th, 2019. It was the most perfect day ever. And then we honeymooned actually here in Montana, and we did some amazing things that Eric has dreamed about his whole life, like fly fishing in the Blackfoot River, and getting way too close to bison in Yellowstone. <laughs> Typical tourists, right? When we got home from our honeymoon, Eric started to tell me about his symptoms, like the weakness in his left hand and the twitching in his arms. So, of course, we went to Google. The first thing that popped up was ALS. Now, we didn't know much about this disease, but we knew it wasn't good, and I could see the fear in his eyes when he read those three letters. However, I wasn't convinced. I told him, there's just no way. You are way too young and healthy, and you're in the best shape of your life. But Eric seemed to be checking every single box for this disease, and I could tell that he was terrified. So we decided to book an appointment with the first available neurologist. And on August 27th, exactly one month to the day of our wedding day, the doctor looked at Eric and said, I'm sure you've heard of Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, and I believe that's what you have. Go live your life, and good luck. And then he left the room. That was it. When you receive a diagnosis like this, you have to get a second opinion, and maybe a third or fourth. And after seeing several doctors who ruled out Lyme disease, 
a pinched nerve, spine or brain injuries, multiple blood tests and genetic tests. The doctors confirm that my husband, Eric, one month after our wedding, at 29 years old, is dying from ALS. Now, let me take a step back a moment and explain for those of you that don't know that the life expectancy of an ALS patient is two to five years. Paralysis will come much sooner than that and all daily life functions will be stripped away. This disease has been known for over 150 years, yet there are only two, yes, you heard that right, two treatment options approved by the FDA for ALS. These medications do nothing substantial for ALS patients, and many don't even choose to take them because of the negative side effects. So as we sat there in the doctor's office, Eric looked up at him and said, OK, tell me what I need to do. How do I fight this? The doctor explained that there aren't many options, because as we already knew, there's no cure for ALS. But he did say that there's hope. For the first time ever, there is a very promising stem cell treatment called Neuron, and it's going through a phase three clinical trial. This treatment is made by a small biotech company in Israel called Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics. Neuron has passed phase one, which tests the safety. It has passed phase two, which measures efficacy. And now, after being stuck, in the FDA trial process for over 10 years, Neuron is in phase three to collect data on a larger group of people. So we are thinking, all right, great, Eric has a chance here. But then we learn that the trial is a double blind, 50% placebo study, meaning that out of the 200 patients accepted into the trial, only 100 will get the real medicine. The other 100 are still going through all the invasive procedures like bone marrow aspirations and multiple lumbar punctures only to get sugar water injected into their spine. So let me get this straight. You are telling me that my husband's life is dependent on the flip of a coin? Why do terminally ill patients have 50% placebo trials? Why do terminally ill patients have no possibility of accessing treatments that are already proven safe and effective? I want to be clear here. I highly respect the FDA and the drug companies who are working to get safe and effective treatments into the bodies of patients. I respect science and I respect the process, but this, this is not working for terminally ill patients. And if you ask the FDA, they would say that there are options such as expanded access or compassionate use. But I'm here to tell you that these programs do not work for ALS patients. Right now, treatments for ALS, which is a fatal disease, are in the same FDA pathway as medicine for arthritis, headaches, and acne medication. Neuron, the ALS treatment in phase three, has shown to slow, stop, and even reverse symptoms in ALS patients. This is the first time in the history of this disease that a treatment has done this. Meet Matt Bellina. Matt is a former Navy pilot, and he's currently receiving Neuron under the Right to Try Act. Matt's the only patient receiving Neuron out of the trial. He fought really hard for this right to try bill, and right now, he's the only one benefiting from it. Matt has had ALS for five years. He's been in a wheelchair for over two of those years, was a quadriplegic, and used a ventilator at night to help him breathe. After receiving several injections of Neuron, Matt Bellina has lifted himself out of his wheelchair, started to walk with assistance. His breathing improved 37%. He ditched his ventilator, and he can now ride a stationary bike for 60 minutes. 
We are talking about someone who has been wheelchair ridden for two years and he is reversing his symptoms with neurone. Please take a moment to let that soak in. There are other patients in the trial who believe they are receiving neurone, although they don't know for sure because it is a double blind study. However, they're getting better. That doesn't just happen with a disease like this. Meet Phil Green. Phil played college football at the University of Washington, and now he's married with four kids. Phil has ALS and was an early phase three neuron participant. After receiving his three injections in the trial, Phil's progression of ALS stopped. Now his trial is over, his injections are complete, and he is cut off from neuron. He is starting to decline again. Meet Mark Bedwell. Mark has ALS and was also an early phase three neuron participant. Before the trial, Mark had difficulty walking and talking. After receiving his three injections, Mark speaks very well, is able to walk, and now he can even run. Mark's trial is over, his injections are complete, and he is cut off from neuron. And you guessed it, he's starting to decline again. These are just two examples of the many participants whose progression of ALS either stopped or reversed, and they are now cut off from the treatment. There is a treatment that is working, and patients are improving, but instead of giving it to people who so desperately need it, it's sitting on a shelf somewhere, and tens of thousands of people are dying. So at what point does the scientific method surpass human compassion, decency, and common sense? While we wait for data, kids are dying. Brothers and sisters are dying. Mothers and fathers are dying. Cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents are dying. My husband is dying. If we allow people to die while waiting on science, then we have failed as human beings to help those facing an unimaginable hell. We need this treatment now for my husband, for Phil Green and Mark Bedwell, and for the 30,000 plus Americans who deserve that chance to fight. When Eric learned about all of this, he knew it just wasn't right. In fact, he would like you to think about it like this. Imagine you are on a boat and you see someone drowning. You have a life ring on board, but you haven't tested the tinsel strength of the rope yet. Are you just going to drive right by and let that person drown because you haven't tested the life ring? Or are you going to risk it, throw them the life ring, and give them a chance to survive? Patients need access to these treatments now so they have a chance at fighting for their life. Doing nothing is the worst possible thing for this disease. Each day, Eric wakes up and his left hand becomes a little bit weaker. His twitching intensifies and spreads to other parts of his body like his legs, back, neck, and tongue. His legs give out more frequently and his speech, it slurs just a little bit more. Each day without treatment is a day lost. Every 90 minutes, someone is newly diagnosed with ALS, and every 90 minutes, someone dies from ALS. You are twice as likely to develop ALS if you are a veteran, athlete, or first responder. ALS is not rare. It is uncommon, but unfortunately, more and more people are being diagnosed with this disease and at younger ages. 
Our goal, Eric's goal, is not to find this magic cure, but to allow patients access to treatments that could help them fight for their lives. ALS needs a different pathway because there are many other treatments coming right behind their own, but unless something changes, these treatments will also be stuck in the long FDA trial process and more and more people will continue to die from this disease. There is no cure for cancer or HIV, but there are excellent treatment options that allow people to live normal or close to normal lives, and this is all we are asking for, for ALS. Instead of checking off his bucket list or taking care of his broken down body, Eric is traveling to Washington, D.C. to advocate for ALS patients around the nation. And although my husband is an incredible fighter, he cannot do this alone. This is a bipartisan issue, so it's not about right or left. It's about right and wrong, and we are going to need help from both sides. There is strength in numbers, and together we can create change. You can also help by sharing our story and educating others about this cruel disease. Our journey has gone viral with the hashtag AxeALS, and we were on The Ellen Show a couple months ago. We urge you to visit our website at stevensnation.com where you can learn how to contact government officials and help us create the powerful policy change that is so desperately needed. We can change this disease from terminal to treatable. My husband is a firefighter. And when there's someone who needs help, he's running towards the danger to save that person. He risks his life every day to save people like you and me. Now, it's our turn. What are we going to do to help save him and the tens of thousands of others who need our help? I'll leave you with some words spoken directly from Eric. He said, When you get a terminal illness like this, obviously a cure would be the best case scenario. But what you really want is just a chance to fight it a chance to live. Treatment is all we ask for. We have a term in the fire department that says, you risk a lot to save a lot. When there's a life on the line, you're gonna risk your life to save that person. And I think the FDA needs that same approach. People are dying, and there's treatment that's showing promising results. So you have to risk a little bit more to give these people a chance. So, why do we fight? Because we will not stand down and we will not run. We fight for the will to live in the hope that the fight will change the course of our lives. Please help us axe ALS. Thank you.